tracking the art and culture changing by periods, we move to the Heian period. And I'm offering this goofy, but hopefully helpful, memory device for you. Heian, H-E-I-A-N. You can think of it as, hey, let's turn inward to Japan. <laughs> because the characteristic of this period is that we now have a new emphasis on Japanese tradition and for us that means looking at a distinctively Japanese style of painting, Yamato-e. And it's also a time when the Japanese imperial family severed ties to China, as the textbook says, I'm quoting the textbook here. So there's both a political and a cultural shift away from that Chinese orientation. And we will take a look at that. So this new era includes a shift from where a shift of the capital from Nara to what we today call Kyoto. And you're looking at photographs of the very beautiful Imperial Palace Kyoto and the Imperial Garden Pond. So you continue to see that tradition of architecture that had been assimilated from China and that very Japanese sense of kind of the beautiful sacredness of nature itself in this new capital. It's so interesting that the capital was moved because the the influence of Buddhism seemed to the political class to becoming to be becoming too much when a and a ruler decides to step off the throne to become a Buddhist monk and then the next ruler in line wants to turn the turn the um turn the ruling the the seat of power over to a buddhist monk so there's a sense that well buddhism needs to back off from the political realm but will remain hugely popular however in terms of what we're looking at we will see a lot of court culture and we will be looking at refined secular arts for the extremely privileged people who are part of the imperial court the textbook gives you a hint of what this court culture was like when they say that it greatly valued refinement. So this was a place where the ultimate exquisiteness of fashion and self-presentation and elegance was a requirement. As they write, pity any man or woman at court who was not accomplished in several forms of art. A woman would be admired for the way she arranged the 12 layers of her robes by color, or a man for knowing which kind of incense was being burned. And she goes on to talk about women, they go on to talk about women being a vital force in Heian society, although they're not quite giving you enough of a sense of how complicated that was. What they're thinking of, of women as a vital force, is particularly Lady Murasaki, who is the author of what is considered the world's first novel, a great work of literature, The Tale of Genji. And it has 54 chapters. It is a hugely complicated and poignant story. And it was an inspiration for art. So this scroll right here is a scene from that epic novel, the oak tree chapter or Kashiwagi chapter. And we can look at it in terms of what it tells us about the novel, and we will in a minute, but first look at what you see, the style, because this is also an example of Yamato-e, Japanese style pictures. So it is not like the Chinese tradition that you've been learning about. And so I've offered this prompt for you to start thinking what makes this painting interesting, strange, or surprising to you compared to what you've been looking at. And so you might even think, compared to the figurative Chinese paintings we've looked at, which are only a few, such as Gu Kaiji's, the space, if you consider how the Chinese painter organizes space, treats space, activates space, how is that different from what's going on here? How would you describe it? And in terms of line or color, what is different? I'm bringing that up partly because you are actually going to be working on this in your peer group with your 
a group assignment for this chapter, this module. So I want you to make sure that you understand what stylistic features in this artwork are typical of Yamatoe paintings so that you can bring that into the work you do as a group. Here are two different scenes, not the ones presented in the textbook, so that you can see a wider range of Yamatoe paintings of the tale of Genji. And one of the things you want to see is that we have these vivid, expressive colors, such as this really strong green that often are used actually on side elements, or what we could call background subsidiary elements, where instead the main characters might be in a kind of monochromatic, a monochromatic field that makes them seem sort of remote compared to this pop of the green, which is the um, fabric of the screen that rolls up and down. Now the compositions are also a hallmark. So you have this kind of what's called a roof blown off where you're looking at two people, it might be hard to tell, but those are people. And it's hard to tell because the figures are very stylized in Yamatoe. They are very abstracted. They are simple, radically simplified, non-naturalistic. Um, two people in a room and you're seeming to be looking down at them as if you know, the roof, as if the roof has been blown off and you could see what's happening from above, which enhances the sense that you're a spectator, a voyeur of a world that you can't quite access. And the remoteness of the figures is enhanced by the fact that their faces are mask-like. And this is referred to as, you know, a hook for a nose, line for an eye. So meaning the artist uses just a hook, a hook mark and a simple line to signify nose and eye, nothing particular, nothing that is actually naturalistic. Third idea that's really important here is that because these faces are mask-like, they're just a hook for a nose and a line for an eye, we actually cannot see emotions directly. Instead, the emotions are displaced onto the landscape. So these scenes, and I'll talk about this in a moment, are full of betrayal and tragedy and complete heartbreak. They're, they're full of emotional violence even and sexual violence, but you don't see that directly. You understand that through things like the withering stalks, where it seems as if the grasses are bending and dying in a kind of wintry chill out here. And that is a metaphor for what's going on inside the psychological worlds of these people. So what I want you to understand is this style, and you can see these wonderful colors, the mask-like faces, the roof blown off. This style is exquisitely fine-tuned to fit court culture, to fit the elegance and the artificiality of court culture, to fit the self-conscious formality and emotional tension. And that is the subject of this marvelous novel that Lady Murasaki wrote. So in order to fully understand how the style relates to the subject, I want to talk a little bit about her novel, which is incredibly difficult to do because the novel is a wild ride. So the textbook presents you this scene and explains that the the protagonist of the tale of Genji, Prince Genji, the shining prince, is viewed from behind while visiting his favorite consort, Murasaki. So it's, they haven't given you nearly enough of the hideous psychopathology that's going on here. Um, so I'm going to try to do that because she's not just one of his favorite consorts. She is a an aristocratic, um, how should I say this? Well, let's just say the truth. She was 10 years old when Genji fell in love with her. Um, and he was told 
that he could not quote unquote have her. So he decides to steal her and just take her to his palace and give her a bunch of toys and turn him into one of his sexual conquests. So this is a story that is filled with sexual desire, sexual conquest, most of it illicit and a great deal of it evolving, involving the fact that f women and girls in this male supremacist society had no agency over their lives and are really um, are sort of tossed around or uh, traded around as if they were objects or possessions because that's what they were. So Genji is a prince, but he in this complicated world, you're going to see in a moment how complicated it is. He is not his mother is not high enough up in the in the status ladder of the emperor's consorts and wives, so he's not eligible for the throne. He does manage to seduce one of the emperor's wives. Okay, so I've made this the 62nd emperor, Kiritsubo, has Fujitsubo as a consort, and other consorts, lower ranked, I've made little hearts. And then I've made a silly little squiggly line to show you with hearts. Genji in love with Fujitsubu, who does produce a child. And the child is passed off as the emperor's son. Now, at the in the oak tree chapter that I want to talk about Genji is also in love is married to the third princess one of the daughters of the previous in line emperor and their half brothers and his best friend has a son Kashiwagi is the oak tree in the oak tree chapter Kashiwagi is obsessed with the third princess. And he's so obsessed that he rapes her. Frequently in summaries of this novel, people will, the websites and other and sort other sources will say he forced her to have sex. That's a ridiculous construction. Forcing someone to have sex is rape. So he rapes her, she becomes pregnant. And then she that child, Genji has to pass off as the pretend son. So what I'm trying to say is what he did with illicit love that resulted in a child who is being, pre that there is a pretense that that child belongs to a different father, that's happening to him. This is karmic blowback of the most painful kind. So at first glance, it's easy to dismiss this tangled web of, um, of illicit and licit couplings as a soap opera, but it really is more profound than that because it what Lady Murasaki managed to do, which was amazing around 1000 CE, was to actually write a novel that expresses the psychological pressure of women in a patriarchal court system where all power, economic power, political power, personal power is passed down from fathers to son and women do not have autonomy or agency. And you see it in the compositions, you see her bent there are actually characters in the in the novel who female characters who kill themselves after being seen combing their hair by a man who should not have seen them combing them, their hair and they have to kill themselves there are all these affairs that we see we seem to be love affairs but they're actually love tainted by this terrible power structure and the secrets and the um betrayals that it inevitably engenders and so these kinds of this style of art was called women's pictures and distinguished from men's pictures where the freedom and the energy and the line work this is a wonderful satire of buddhist um culture where you have a frog buddha and you have a monkey monk, which is a very silly thing to say, sitting before burning incense and there's smoke coming out of the mouth, which is actually the chanting coming out of the mouth. So this is a social and public theme. This absolutely has a public dimension because it's about how the court is 
structured, but it's very much about the internal pressures that women in particular lived under. 